fall down seven times, get up eight. It's the same thing with life, right? You're going to fail, and I've failed so many times. How's it going, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 546, with today's guest, Dr. Shauna Pandya. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host for Martial Arts Radio. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, and I love traditional martial arts, which is why everything we do at Whistlekick is in support of the traditional arts. If you want to see what that means, see all the different things that we do, go to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. And one of the things you're going to find over there is our store. If you use the code PODCAST15, that gets you a surprising 15% off any of the products over there. And it helps us know that this show is valued and helps offset some of the costs. You're going to find plenty of stuff over there, but what you won't find is all the information on Martial Arts Radio. It gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you two brand new shows every week. And why do we do that? Why do we do what we do? Well, we're trying to educate, entertain, and connect traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can do it. You could make a purchase. You could share an episode. Follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. You tell a friend, pick up a book, leave a review, or support the Patreon. If you think the new shows that we're doing are worth 63 cents a piece, well, consider signing up for the $5 a month tier. And we're going to give you even more. In fact, you can go as low as two bucks. And even at two bucks, we give you more exclusive content that you won't find anywhere else. If I was to read the bio, even an abbreviated bio for today's guest, you would skip forward because it's that long. Dr. Panya has done and is doing a tremendous amount of stuff. She has achieved very high levels in quite a number of disciplines, including martial arts. We talk about her time as a martial artist and, most importantly to me, how her martial arts training impacts and furthers these other goals and pursuits that she has. So let's listen and hope you enjoy it. Dr. Pandya, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being here. You know, we'll, as we get going, um, I think listeners might, might realize that we, we could have introduced you by a number of titles, uh, and I'll, I'll let that unfold as it goes. But as I was looking through your bio and stuff, there, there are a lot of ways that we could introduce someone who has done the things that you have done. And I, and I find that fascinating. Of course, here on Martial Arts Radio, it's about showcasing how martial arts leads to other things and, and sets people up for life. And I've got a feeling that martial arts has woven its way into quite a few aspects of, of who you are and what you do. That is very, very true. Um, I've often joked to friends that you can take a girl out of the dojang, but you t- cannot take the dojang out of the girl. Oh, I like that. I like that. That should be on a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I would wear that t-shirt. Absolutely. Absolutely. There we go. Maybe, maybe that's our next t-shirt. I mean, we, I don't know. That, it's, it's, your, it's your idea, so I don't want to steal it, but somebody's got to put that on a shirt. You should put that on a shirt. Well, tell you what, if people listening tell us on social media that they would wear that shirt, I think we should go ahead and make that. Perfect. Let's do it. Let's do it. Now, Dojang suggests to me Taekwondo. Yes. Is that where you started? Yeah. Is that, is, was that your first martial art? How, how did that happen? How did you get started in Taekwondo? Okay. So um, what may become apparent throughout the course of this conversation is as a kid, I was quite ambitious, but I had a lot of goals. And um, at one point in my life, like, when I was 10, I sat down and made, it was like, okay, you're 10. Like, what have you done with your life? And so then I made, (laughs) I made this list of things that I wanted to achieve in my life. And, um, one of those included getting a black belt in a martial art. Um, and so that, that went on the list and then a few more years rolled by. And again, it's sort of like this existential crisis. I was 15 and I was like, okay, you're 15. What have you done to achieve any of your goals? You haven't even started in the martial arts. So that was when I decided it was time. And so my, you know, I think a, a lot of the way many of us get involved with martial arts is proximity. And, um, you know, whether that's parents watching their kids and then realizing, I could do more than just watch joining the class. So for me, um, there's a Taekwondo Doshing right by my dad's place 
of work. And so it was really convenient to be able to walk over to the doje and then walk to my dad's clinic once, um, once I was done with classes. So that's actually how I ended up in martial arts was a, a bit of an existential crisis of being an ambitious kid as well as geographic proximity. All right. Now, you heard my laughter. Everybody heard my laughter coming down with this big life goals bucket list at age 10. That's first, that's something I don't, I don't know too many. I, I haven't met anybody who's done that at that age. Number one, two, do you still have that list? You know, that's a good question. I don't know where the actual list is because <laughs> it, it ended up being quite long, but I think some oh. of the things really stayed with me. You know, everyone has that childhood goal of, you know, wanting to be an astronaut. And I don't think that ever left me. I'm still a space cadet through and through. So um, the, the big, the big themes, um, you know, ended up being a part of my everyday life. Definitely. And I guess the, the second half of that whole Genesis is where did that come from? Was that parental encouragement or we could look at it, you know, another way pressure um, were you around a lot of highly functioning people? Like wh wh where does a 10 year old decide I'm going to plot out my life? You know, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I think a common theme in my life has always been pushing the limits and trying to find where that boundary is and still not having found it. Um, or when I do find it, just pushing even further. And I was just a really, really ambitious kid. Um, I have, I have an entire Ted talk on this about, you know, pushing the limits. And when I was a kid, I, I joked that I became progressively less ambitious. Like I started off wanting to be a superhero when I was four or a transformer. And then I realized I grew up a little bit when I was seven. It's like, well, that's silly. You can't grow up to be those things. So then I wanted to be a billionaire and use all of my wealth to solve all the world's problems. And then again, reality hit and I realized, well, you can't just grow up and be a billionaire. So then I settled on astronaut. And then it's like, okay, well, then you need to do something before you be an astronaut. And then that goal in turn was guided by Canada's first female astronaut in space, Dr. Roberta Bondar. So she was a physician. She was a neuroscientist. So I looked at that and I said, okay, well, she's a doctor. Check. Um, you know, I could, I'm going to go be a doctor. Uh, she's, she's a neuroscientist. So my first major is going to be neuroscience. And so that, that really guided a lot of, a lot of um, my path. But, you know, coming back to your original question, I absolutely, no, you know, I, was, I, I lived in this world of big dreams, big ambitions, no limits. And either, you know, maybe, maybe people told me that was unrealistic or maybe I didn't listen. I don't know which, but it's worked out well. Wow. You know, it, as, you're, as you're describing your childhood, it sounds like you might be the first person for whom looking at being an astronaut was a fallback. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of blowing my my mind. So I'm I'm curious because as as we talk to guests on the show we find out that parental involvement and just the way kids are raised really has such a, a profound impact in and around martial arts and of course as we age. So you know you talked about being 15 and and starting in taekwondo. What were your parents thoughts on you getting involved with martial arts? You know, they, they just, I think they just kind of, they went with it. Um, they were never, they were never like, oh, you can get hurt. They were never, um, oh, this is, this is a guy's sport. They were never, never anything like that. I think, you know, this is the age when you're doing your full honors course load, you're doing a million extracurriculars. Um, you know, they, it was just another thing on the pile. Um, and then once, I was lucky that I was taller for my age when I was at that age. Um, and so in anyone who practices Taekwondo knows what a huge advantage that is, it's a sparring ring. And so when I went to my first tournament as a yellow belt, it was either yellow stripe, no, it was yellow belt, um, and end up med ended up meddling, um, you know, they're like, oh, hey, you know, you're enjoying this, you're good at it. <laughs> it gets you out of the house. I think they were, you know, they were very, very laid back about it. And it actually wasn't until I got older and pursued some surgical training that they're like, maybe you should reconsider this. Um, and then, you know, when the, the whole idea of concussion in sport became a lot more important, like when I was a, 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 in adulthood, that's kind of when they um, maybe reconsidered their, their opinion. But overall, they, they, 
very much, you know, we're supportive throughout the journey. Mm. Yeah, uh, certainly height, age, when we get involved and what martial art we get involved in can really have quite an impact on how well it resonates with us. And it sounds like you ended up in the right discipline at the right time and it it's worked well for you. But I want to start talking about how Taekwondo has feathered out into these other things. I mean, you've thrown a lot of stuff at us already. And and I know from reading your bio that there's there's a an even longer list. There's more that we're going to discover about you. But let's let's talk about why there are so many things on that list. You 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 know, you've you've made a long list at 10, you updated it at 15. I mean, there there's there's obviously a drive to to accomplish a lot. So I'm guessing you hate being bored. And unless you have too much to do, you don't get anything done. Am I right? Uh, you know, that's, I think you've pegged me probably better than anyone has. And it's, I'm like Newton's third law of motion. Um, if I'm at rest, I stay at rest. But if I'm, if I'm on the go, I do not want to stop. I want to blaze through all of my items on my to-do list. So very accurate. Well, you can take a wild guess as to why I was able to peg you as such a person. <laughs> I don't identify with that statement at all. Not at all. No, not one bit. <laughs> so you, you identified one of your role models, you know, yes. the, this, this first female astronaut in Canada who, uh, ironically, I know a tiny, tiny bit about uh, through pop culture and watching the, the TV show Letterkenny. Uh, <laughs> surprisingly, when you mentioned the name, I went, oh, that's, that's funny. I know something about this person from a random occurrence. That's awesome. How did, how did, <laughs> thanks. How did following sort of the, the, I don't want to say in her path, but how did having her as someone that you looked up to start to impact those decisions of, of school? You mentioned neuroscience, that that was, that was your first major? Yes. Yeah. Talk to us about how that started to roll out. Yeah. So when you're, when you're a kid and you have a dream, it's, you don't look at the, oh my God, this could be so hard. Oh my God, there's all of these obstacles. Oh, look how much, how many years of schooling that is. Like, honestly, in my, in my, my little girl brain, it was, okay, she's Canadian. I'm Canadian. Check, check. She's a girl guide. I'm a girl guide. Hey, we have so much in common. So now all I need to do is be a neuroscientist, physician, an astronaut, and I am set. Um, and <laughs> it was like, okay, so that. You know, it, it really took a lot of the stress off. It's like, okay, well, then my first major will be neuroscience. Then I'm going to go be a physician. Then um, I diverged slightly. I think she's a neuro-ophthalmologist. I was like, okay, I'm going to be a neurosurgeon. And, you know, that just, it, it's like these decisions made themselves. And for me, it just took a lot of the pressure off. So, um, you know, uh -huh. it's, I think for, if I was a little bit older and wiser, I would have maybe thought, thought that through a little bit more. But when you're, you know, when you're driven by something, you're very, very passionate about um you know it's you're excited by by the the frontiers that that opens up and by the the thought of what it means to both attain your goal but the journey to get there did you make any more of those those lists oh god did you yeah. update it yeah, yeah yeah all the time how, um at the how bar. did they change you know early early in the pandemic i was uh, things were going really really well 2019 was an amazing year and we could talk about everything that happened last year in terms of extreme environment um exploration you know going to the bottom to the living under the ocean for a couple of days all of that um and so you know i had a lot of momentum coming into 2020 um and i was like okay well this is a great trajectory so how do i keep up this momentum how do I stay on target? And then I kind of made a list of all of the things I wanted to do um, with, you know, with my career. And some of them were near term. Some of them were um, a bit longer term because there's only so many hours in a day. Um, and, you know, it felt it felt really good to to actually be able to take this idea of a space dream and, you know, break it down further and talk about space and space medicine and actually realize that you know, all of these dreams I had as a kid have not only manifested themselves in one way or another, but have actually surpassed everything I thought I could do as a kid. And that's just an amazing feeling. Do you remember when you first realized that, that you were surpassing all of these goals? Um, the, there were a couple of key moments that have all just happened in the last 
year. And so um, one of my one of my good friends, he's a science communicator and he's, you know, he hangs out with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill, Bill Nye, <laughs> like, but he's just so humble and he's just so, so, so sweet. And, you know, he asked me to give a talk at one of the conferences he's putting on it on exactly that, like on, on, you know, charting your tra- trajectory. And, um, you know, that's kind of when I sat back and reflected on it. And um, even, you know, the, the other two key moments, I was at the Canadian Space Agency's um, Space Health Forum in November of last year and um, met up with one of my collaborators. And that ended up turning into another job opportunity um, where with like Sonic Technologies, which is a Canadian company, where I helped develop VR, virtual reality technologies for deep space. And we were just standing around just, you know, surmising like, hey, you know, as an adult, you can wear multiple hats and you can do it in ways that you never thought possible. Um, so that was the second instance. And then I didn't, you know, it didn't really strike me at the time. But the third instance, now that I look back on it, it was like, holy cow, like this, this is, you know, a sign that it's actually possible. Um, and so that instance was last year, the Ontario Science Centre. So that's Canada's biggest science center they put together a canadian women in space exhibit and then they featured um three prominent women um canadian women who have furthered space exploration and so this is where things came full circle and they had my exhibit my photo right next to dr roberta bondars and it's like holy cow i grew up idolizing this person so then to be featured next to her to open the museum ex- exhibit next to her, to, you know, be on stage. Um, you know, that was like, oh my goodness, is, <laughs> is this real? Like, I think it's a bit early for me to be here, um, but I'll go with it. So is it fair to say that you don't perceive limits? That you just... I, I, it's That's coming off kind of, kind of flip, and that's not how I mean it. It think- seems like... Yeah, when ahead. you decide to strike out for something, when, you, when, you're, when you're working towards something, when a goal pops into mind, your first thought is not all of the limitations or the roadblocks, the things that are going to make this difficult, but rather, I'm guessing the other side, the, the positives, why you can, maybe, maybe not the best form question, but I think you know where I'm going. Yeah. And, you know, I think, I think the way I look at it is, you know, there's this perception that when you're successful, you're successful, you go from point A to point B. Um, but oftentimes the road is a lot more convoluted than that. There's a lot more trust and peace than that simple straight arrow. And it's honestly my biggest, my biggest sticking point. What's gotten me where I am is this stick to itiveness. It's not giving up, it's grit. And um, you know, there's there was a sign on the on our dojang for the longest in the girls dressing room um for the longest time that said fall down seven times get up eight and it's it's the same thing with life right you're you're going to fail and i've failed so many times um but it's it's about realizing that you have to have that mental fortitude to get up keep going whether you're in the ring whether you're in life um and it's also realizing there's a way to fail productively that sucks that success and failure can be two sides of the same coin I've I've succeeded not very gracefully and I've I've failed very gracefully. Um and then taking those lessons learned, like dissecting whether whether it was a fight that went well or that went wrong. Um, you know, and then reviewing the game tape afterwards, um, and then just saying, Okay, this went well, let's keep this in my arsenal for future future fights. Um, mm-hmm. or this didn't go so well, and then taking the opportunity to to learn um and then apply it to the next time you reach the situation. So it's not it's not so much always being successful. It's finding a way to bounce back, um, and that's true for martial arts. It's true for space. It's true for life. I can imagine someone listening to our conversation and thinking, "Well, you know, what kind of adversity has this woman faced? It sounds like she's just knocking down these lifelong goals that any one of them would give most people a." a a happy, good life, and you're accumulating them like merit badges, you know, what, where has she struggled? So I'd like to ask you that. What does 
a successful failure look like to you? Where have you had to struggle through some adversity? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think the most prominent example um, for anyone who's who's followed me for a long time um, is that I have a TED talk called "On Success, Failure, Resilience, and Pushing Limits." And so coming back to the story arc of what it was I sought out to do with my life, I, I in fact did make it to neurosurgery, um, so brain spine surgery, and trained in that for a few years. And then you know it became apparent that for a variety of reasons that this wasn't the path. Um, and so after three years of training um, in a six year training program, I left and that wasn't a very good feeling. Like you just you feel like you hit rock bottom because you, you, for lack of a better word, failed. You didn't do what you thought out to do. Um, and that required a lot of soul searching and learning how to reframe and learning to bounce back and you know learning the key the key components of resilience and all the research around it reading it and realizing how important good people are um, and the power of a social support network and so mm -hmm. um you know that was a, that was a very 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 instructive journey and it's not that it wasn't an emotionally challenging one or a, it wasn't it wasn't not that it was simple um but it was you know what i've learned is that sometimes failure can be the best I can imagine just based on my own experiences that having to step out or choosing to step out of that program, the emotion, the stress, the feeling like you're letting yourself down or others down. And I, I've, I've got a feeling that you're probably glossing over the, the emotional toll that it took on you. So I'm, I'm wondering, because I think retrospect is really such a valuable teaching tool. If you now could travel back in time and talk to you then as you are leading up to making that decision, stepping out of that neurosurgery program, what advice would you give yourself? As I was leaving the program? Yeah. Um, I think one of the key, the big things I've learned is, um, you know, and this even applies to being extremely busy on a day-to-day -day basis is that maybe you don't need to, Imagine you're swinging through the jungle on vines and we are swinging from vine to vine. Maybe it's not always necessary to know where the last vine is and where it's going to end up, but maybe it's just no, it's enough to know where the next few vines are. So you don't actually fall off um, and mid swing. And I think that's, that's probably just as applicable to life. It's almost counter to some of the messaging that we've heard from you today that you don't have to plan everything out. Maybe you need some balance. Yeah. Sometimes you plan, sometimes you have faith. Yeah. And I think that's also, so there's, there's a couple of philosophical notes there, you know, like if you're, if you're ambitious and you're, and you have all these plans, you know, you often think about that stereotype of the person who's very, you know, has to plan everything out. Everything has to go to plan. Um, and if not, it's, you know, it's cataclysmically um, awful, you know, because then it's not according to plan. Um, but for me, it's always been like, okay, these are the big ticket goals that I have. Now let's look at the opportunities to get there. And if, you know, if something else comes up, we'll evaluate that on its own merits and weigh the pros and the cons, and then see if that's the right decision. And that's actually how I ended up at the International Space University. Um, like I said, when I started, my goal was to go from point A to point B, neuroscience, doctor, be a neurosurgeon and then um in the same year i applied to medical school um i realized i needed a plan b i needed a contingency that because medical school was so competitive um so i applied to the masters in space studies at the international space university which is it's like real life starfleet academy in strasbourg france it was it was amazing um you know, and I thought, okay, let me at least get into this program. And to my surprise, I got into both med school and, and ISU in the same year. Wow. Um, and that led to a good, tough decision to have to make. And I had never, ever thought that I would turn down anything for medical school. Um, and then this opportunity came along and I realized I really wanted to make space part of my life, part of my career. And that was just kind of what, <laughs> what it's, um, came down to the bigger theme of sometimes you don't, everything doesn't have to go to plan um, as long as you keep your end goal in mind. Well said. 
Now, I'd like to unpack martial arts. You know, we're we're talking about all these these inter- interconnected elements, and I think it, it's going to be maybe a little challenging to do this, but I'd, I'd like you to try. What if we were to, to extract, you know, some let's let's imagine it like brain surgery. You know, we're trying to disconnect all of these aspects that martial arts became and and led you to. If we were to separate that from your life, how would things be different? How would you be a different person without having stepped into that dojang at 15? Yeah, and that's a perfect question. Um so I kind of told you the abbreviated version of my TED Talk title, but because it would fit all on the same title slide, um, the <laughs> prolonged version is what I've learned from piloting, skydiving, martial arts, and my dad. And so I've learned so many life lessons about resilience from martial arts. Um, and, you know, whether they're, they're those inspirational posters you see on the Dojang wall or just lessons you learn about the value of being with a team um, or these people become your family. Um, you know, I, Taekwondo, I've been in since 1999. <laughs> I feel old saying that. So, so since 20, for 21 years now. Um, and so to take the lessons learned, you know, I very much, I was, I was only partially joking when I said, you know, you can take a girl out of the dojang, but you can't take the dojang out of the girl. So, you know, even, and I think this is a really important lesson for anyone who's had significant um, time and training in martial arts and then had to take time off. It, it's not, you know, your time away from martial arts isn't a forever thing and your time with martial arts um, may not always be a forever thing. Um, it's going to change depending on life circumstances, but there, there will always be a place for you back. You know, with where I train, it, your, your belt designation is what you've earned. And if, even if you even if you were a black belt out of it for 20 years, if you want to come back and train, we will start training you back up at the designation that you left at because that's what you earned. Um, and so it's, it's, it's the same thing for, for life, for friendships, for relationships. It's sinusoidal. You're going to have your, your times when you're training, you know, hours a day because you have a major international competition coming up and that's all you do. And you're going to have years where you have to take time away for me because I was in surgical training. Um, and doesn't, doesn't mean you're any less, um, you know, it doesn't take away anything from what you've achieved. And those relationships, in my case, um, certainly are there. You know, I still message my, my Taekwondo instructor, who's become a good friend regularly. So um, I think that's one of the big takeaways when it comes to, you know, looking at how martial arts um, has an impact on my life and what it's, what it's taught me. Let's switch gears. Time management. <laughs> You're doing so much. And I can imagine people listening saying, how is she getting all of this done? How does she deal with this volume? And so I'll ask you, how do you get the, all of this done? Okay, so I have to, you know, I, I get asked this a lot. And so it's easy to imagine that, okay, maybe I'm piloting my own plane and then skydiving into the ocean and then submerging and dive gear. <laughs> just in time to rush into the emergency room and deliver a baby and then grab my gym bag and go to the dojang afterwards. And like, that's, that's not it at all. That's not what happens. That's not a Tuesday for you. I'm not actually James Bond. <laughs> um, well, this interview's over. <laughs> yeah. You'll have to find the Dosa Keith guy to find the most interesting guy. Um, he no. actually lives uh, 45 minutes from me. <laughs> Dead serious. Really? That's awesome. Yeah. That's- yeah. Slightly amazing. I, I, I thought he was on a one-way mission to Mars now, but <laughs> you heard it here first. The truth has emerged. That's super cool. Um, yeah. So no, coming back to your question, it, um, you know, it's just think of it being a star varsity athlete in high school. Like there, even if you're playing hockey, football, lacrosse, soccer, badminton, basketball, volleyball, there is a season for everything. You are not training for all of those sports in the same night like that would just lead to injury and burnout and so same thing with all of the hats I wear so like to put it you know when people ask me to do the one-line introduction of myself it's that I'm a full-time physician in clinic and ER 
American scientist astronaut candidate, Aquanaut, um, director of the Institute of Astronautical Sciences, Space Medicine Group, um, VP of Immersive Medicine, Luxonic, martial artist, skydiver, pilot in training, and scuba diver. Um, that sounds like a lot, but there's a season for everything. I'm not doing all of that in the same 24 hour period. You know, I, you know, one day might be a research day. One may be a meeting planning day. One may be a weekend on call, right? So it's, it's knowing, it's taking the time to know your, your schedule, your priorities, and then also, you know, realize what needs to be done today, what needs to be done tomorrow, what needs to be done short term, intermediate term and long term. And so a lot of it is the secret sauce. It's not, it's not sexy, it's not flashy, but it's organization, um, discipline, and taking the time to invest in, in your, yourself. Do you have any organizational strategies or tools? Are you, you know, are you a paper planner person? Are you, you know, do you have some kind of personal Asana Slack uh, how- board? <laughs> you know, how, 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 do you, how do you organize all of it? Um, so checklists read my life. I have two notebooks, um, one for my personal, that's just checkbox after checkbox after checkbox. Um, I have one that's professional, um, for more for my, um, electronic work. Um, and then, you know, if I have to do write down things on the go, um, I use the digital version of that. I use Google notes to just type things to myself that need to be done today. Um, sometimes I organize them into categories, um, and then I am part of way too many Slack channels for all of the different. <laughs> um, I'm I part of uh, so, but personally, I, I do just like pen and paper. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's amazing when you when you start talking to people who get a lot done. You're initially you're expecting that they're going to be these magic answers. Oh, well, you know, I discovered this, this technique that nobody else knows. And, and, you know, we do that in martial arts too, right? We, we, we get to meet these amazing masters, people who've been training decades and decades. And, and we think that their success in longevity is going to be based around some mystical formula that we're not privy to. And then you find out it's consistency and it's hard work and it's, chipping away towards that next checkbox. Absolutely. And, you know, here's some, so here's some of the pearls that I've learned from looking into to the research around resilience. And it, it's that same thing. It's that, that intuitiveness, that, you know, willingness to not give up. And it's not that I'm smarter or more talented than anyone. It's just that I, I work harder and I give up less, I would say. That's, that's all there is to it. Um, and you, even the research around resilience says impulse control. So that resisting that impulse to, to give up. Um, and then there's a psychologist named Angela Duckworth. Um, she wrote a book called Grit. And it was funny because I was listening to this um, for one of her interviews around the time the book came out. And this is actually when I was training for the World um, Cup for Taekwondo. Um, that was going to take place in Budapest. So this is around 2016. So I was really applying all of these things both to my training and to my life. And um, one of the things she found in her research is it's not just practice. When you look at the most accomplished athletes or violinists or chess masters, it's directed practice. It's, you know, taking that single kick and breaking it down into, okay, well, what am I working on today? Am I working on the height? Am I working on the accuracy? Uh, am I working on the speed? And then just working towards a single goal. And if you can, for some people, that, that's boring. But when you look at how kids learn, they just do the same thing over and over and over to attain that mastery. Um, for me, you know, that's, that's been really a huge part of it. Makes sense. Anything that I've managed to accomplish or move forward in my life, I certainly didn't just practice or do for the sake of practicing and doing there was a there was an intention there was some goal or milestone to chip away at to chart my progress yes yeah and like taking i think this is a really important point to to take the time to give yourself enough credit at the end of the day like we get so used to saying oh hey i didn't do anything today and just you know being hard on ourselves but you know there's 24 hours and if you take the time to list everything you did, it actually ends up being a lot, even if it's you attended a meeting, 
you did laundry, you did, you know, once you list every little thing that you, you, you did um, in a particular 24 hours, it actually becomes easier to appreciate yourself and, um, you know, give yourself the credit you deserve. Mm. I'm sure that to-do list, those check boxes make that a little bit easier. Yeah, if you're OCD I've, like me, it's super satisfying. <laughs> I've heard some people suggest that instead of having a to-do list, have a done list. Because if, if, you're, if you're someone who gets wrapped up in the anxiety of not getting stuff done or feeling down on yourself because you're not you know, where you want to be or accomplishing or whatever, that to mark out these things that you accomplish day to day can give you something to hang your hat on, so to speak. I have never heard of that concept, but it makes sense because me and my friends laugh at ourselves because at the end of the day, um, sometimes when we're going through our to-do list, we'll joke that, hey, I just added something just so I can cross it off, right? Because it feels good. It feels good to get things done. Um, and again, going, delving back into the world of psychology, because this stuff is so fascinating. Um, a psychologist once told me that the research shows that the two things that are shown to make a day a good day are engaging in activities that are either productive or pleasurable. So think of cleaning your room, productive pleasurable playing your favorite video game, right? So it makes perfect sense that you're engaging those um, reward centers in your brain. Now you've brought up competition a couple times. So let's, let's steer into that and talk about where it went from that first competition as a yellow belt and being taller and meddling to, you know, where, where did it go from there? And what, how does competition fit into your life if, if it does today? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, I've, there's nothing like training for competition um, because you're going all in, you're putting in the hours and you're doing it with a team. Even if it ends up being um, a, a individual sparring match, you're training together as a team, you're getting, getting better as a team, you're going through injury, um, you know, watching your teammates experience injury and recovery. Um, and then when the, the event comes, you're experiencing successes and failures together um, as a team. And so my first international competition would have been summer of 2005. This was, it was an, I think it was the national or international competition in Las Vegas. Um, so I think it was like the U.S. Taekwondo Nationals, but we were, we went down as a Canadian team. So. It went for all intents and purposes. It was considered international, and so that's that summer was awesome. Um, you know, you're you're training, um, you're you're training for two hours in the dojang every night, and that's just in the dojang. And then you know, whatever you do for cardio, um, practice at home on top of that. Um, you're you're going to every single sister dojang, even if it requires driving forty minutes an hour one way to get there. Um, you know, you're, you're sweating buckets, um, you're, you're setting the goals for what you, what it is you want to achieve. Um, and so that was, you know, that was the training was valuable. Um, bonding with the team was valuable. Um, and then when he got to the day, you know, the week weekend of the competition, um, it was the first time facing international competitors. And this kind of, again, speaks to the value of a good team. Um, so uh, I ended up fighting a girl from, I want to say, Kazakhstan. And she she was good. And <laughs> rule number one is you don't drop your hands. But I dropped my hands. And she ended up punching out my contact lens right early on. And so, um, you know, she was clearly dominating the first half of the fight. Um, but this was, my team was at the, all around the, the ring and they were just cheering me on and they're just, you know, telling me to get back in there. And that's, you know, there was, it was like a flip, a switch flip at that moment. And it's sort of like, I didn't come down here to lose, um, without a fight. And, you know, it just, it's sort of like when you're in a video game and you put on turbo mode, um, you know, I just came back and it was only a matter of time like it was I dominated the second half of that fight um 
you know, there's still one of my teammates got an awesome photo of, you know, me landing a perfect punch to the face. And I still ended up losing, but the comeback, you know, and the fact that the team was there behind you felt so amazing. And so just all of the lessons learned doesn't, doesn't matter that it didn't have the outcome. I didn't, um, didn't, wasn't look, I wasn't looking for it. Didn't end in the outcome I was looking for, but just the experience, um, was, was so incredible and so many lessons learned from that. Well, we, we know from your description there that you're not a practitioner of WTF or WT style. Taekwondo. No, no. <laughs> we learned that. Wow. It, what was it like going that far, putting in all that time as someone who I expect is used to reaching their goals and then not winning that match? So I think when you're setting goals for yourself, and we talk about this concept in medicine all the time, we talk about, quote unquote, managing expectations. So, you know, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned is that you can't go into every scenario, regardless of how long your resume is, you cannot go into every scenario expecting it would be the best because that just sets you up for failure. It sets people up, others' expectations um, um, up for expecting the wrong things of you. And it also, it doesn't do your team any favor. And so I didn't, I certainly didn't go into that, that competition thinking, oh, hey, I'm going to win more like I've trained for this and I'm not going to let my training down. Um, and so, you know, to, to know, or to go in there thinking I would get gold, um, knowing that, you know, especially at the black belt level, the game changes very much. It's not about technique. It's just, about, it's also about being a chess. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, having goals of performing the best I possibly could, um, playing strategically, you know, performing, in, in the pattern section, performing patterns as best as I possibly could. And um, those are, that matters a lot more because if your expectation is gold, gold, first of all, my track record was never gold, 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 gold <laughs> throughout regionals, throughout nationals. Um, it was consistently meddling, but it wasn't always gold, gold. And I, you know, grown up with practitioners who had that track record um, and I saw how good they were. So I, I didn't have that expectation. I had more of the expectation of what can I learn from this international experience? Will I want to do it again? Um, I did end up meddling. I think um, it was either bronze, bronze or bronze, silver, that, that tournament. So it was, it was more like, okay, you know, this, this was a good start. Where do we, where do we go to next? So that was, that it, it comes back to that theme of pushing the limits, you know, found our first limit and how do we build on what we've, what we've learned there. And I think when we really, really drill down anything that we do, it's that iteration loop. It's that, okay, here's the thing. I'm moving in this direction. I can't get there. What did I learn? How do I potentially adjust and try again? And when I hear someone talk about it the way you are, it, it sounds... It, it can sound challenging. It can sound overwhelming. And yet, I think it's something that we all do at a small level every single day. You know, how, how do we know not to kick the, the leg of the chair that's, you know, maybe kind of sticking out a little bit in the living room? Well, because we've done it a bunch of times and know not to do it anymore. We don't put our hand on a hot stove because, well, we probably did that at one point as a child and went, oh, let's not keep doing this. And so finding those, those paths to success really, in my opinion, and it sounds like you would agree, are just ruling out bad options and coming down to some ones that may work. Yeah, totally. And I often like to say that pain and failure can be beautiful teachers if you, if you let them. Like, why do we have pain receptors in the first place? Um, exactly like you said. So, you know, if we didn't experience pain um, physically, we wouldn't know to not engage in that same sequence of events again. Um, and the same is true of emotional pain, the pain of losing the pain of failing it's if you didn't experience that then how would you get better how would you know not to repeat that again um so absolutely i agree with everything you just said i'm sure as you've had the opportunity to travel and train and compete you've bumped into some utterly amazing martial artists you mentioned that you're 
don't know if it's your your first or primary Taekwondo instructor, someone that you've stayed in touch with and, and communicate with often. But are there other people? Is there anyone else that maybe you want to tell a story about somebody that made an impact on you? Yeah, for sure. And so um, my my Taekwondo instructor is amazing. He's been to Worlds. He's been to Pan Am. He's medal. Like he's, you know, he really is the gold standard. Um, and, you know, he will tell Tell you those stories of like how are, how are you so good um and it a you know he he'll tell us the the ten thousand kick story he'll tell us of all the stuff he had to do old school when he was just starting out as well um so there's no secret sauce to it um but even just watching my my taekwondo um uh fellow practitioners like whether they were the same level the lower uh, a lower level you know you can learn something from everyone you meet um and so i was alluding to um the type of practitioner who always gets double gold patterns barring every tournament um and so there was another instructor like that um and when i started he was either first degree black belt or black right um and now i think he's a fourth or fifth degree black belt um but i'd only ever known him just to have perfect patterns and you know, they were, they were amazing, like, you know, just sharp, very technically good. And it's like, oh, you're just, you know, for the long, and it took me embarrassingly long. It took me like maybe 15 years of knowing him before I realized that wasn't always the case. And so even before he told me that story, I always noted what he did to get better. Um, you know, and this comes a little bit back to the idea of directed practice, as well as time management. And so, um, you know, you'd finish your forms and then maybe the instructor would take a second to, you know, offer some general advice to the class. And I'd always notice in like that, maybe that 10, that 20 second gap between finishing up one exercise and going to the next, whether, whether it was feedback from the head instructor or if he was just trying to practice a single um, oh. a series of moves that he wanted to get better at, he would take that time. He would fill the time that most other people would spend around waiting you try to get better um and then he also you know so that's the first part of it the direct practice and then um coming back to the story you know that took me decades of knowing him years of knowing him to find out is he told me he actually sucked at patterns when he started out and he would just always lose he would you know and he finally he just got sick of it and he just practiced 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 and he'd already been in Taekwondo for years when I'd met him. Um, but so I only ever just knew him as the technically, you know, excellent one, the one who always just was really, really good. Um, and, you know, same, it's that same fallacy mistake that I tell people not to make. Don't look at someone who's successful and assume they just woke up like that. It takes years of practice. Um, so that was really an important lesson. Um, and it, it's funny because I I posted that as black belt training secret number four hundred and thirty one to to our Taekwondo group. It's like take the time to to practice and, and break it down and do it with intent. It's so easy to assume that these wonderful, amazingly skilled martial artists just started that way on their first day. That they were all that you know the. The figurative Chuck Norris, the one who yeah. can do no wrong. You know, we, we we look at these people and think they've always been that way, but they haven't. None of them have. We we all started. We all fumbled. At some point, none of us knew how to tie our belt. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, it's it, so true. We, we all had that starting point. And I think it, it can be easy to forget when we're around greatness like that. So it's, it's yeah. nice to have the reminder. We've all made our rookie mistake for sure. For, and some of us keep making them. <laughs> raising, okay, so, raising my hand. As a, as a quick as a quick aside, so Ricky yeah. mistake that I made is yellow belt. I assumed the belt needed to be washed as well, and I super did not sell, separate the yellow belt from the oh. dough box. Uh, oh. So for the longest time, it looked like I was walking around with yellow chalk on my back. <laughs> so, so there's my my free pearl of wisdom to any listeners: uh, do not wash your belt. <laughs> Or if you do, separate the colors. Yeah, also, yeah. <laughs> like it. Now, I, I, always has, I always ask this question of guests talking about the future. I, I hesitate 
to ask. I'm going to ask it anyway, but I wonder if we have enough time. I'm mostly making a joke here, but I think there's an element of truth. What does the future hold for you? If we look out five, 10, 20, a hundred years, and we, if we were to get back in touch, maybe have a part two and talk about what's transpired between now and whatever that time is, what, what would you be saying? What would you hope you would tell me? Oh, you know, I, I did this, this, and this, you know, we, we've, we haven't really talked about your time, you know, under the water. I mean, there, there's so much that we've got there. So what's going on for you in the future? Oh gosh. Um, the, the one line answer is I hope that I will have gotten to space. Um, you know, that's definitely, definitely high on the priority list. Um, continuing to explore extreme environments, um, you know, living underwater. Um, I would definitely do that again in a heartbeat going to Antarctica, that's on the bucket list. Um, and then, you know, it's been a it's been a weird year with the pandemic. Uh, I'm definitely ready to get back in the Tojang. Um, you know, uh, like I said, Taekwondo and the relationships that I've had with martial arts have been sinusoidal and cyclical, not philosophically, that part's never left, but the physical part. And, um, you know, it's, it's always like coming back home again. Um, even when you switch to a different martial art, even, you know, when you, you try different, um, different sports, that's been my experience with Muay Thai, is it's very, very welcoming. Um, and so to go, to go back, train a little bit, that would be um, really nice as well. Yeah, you just dropped a bunch of stuff in there. We probably could do a second hour. Maybe, maybe we'll have to have you back so we can do that. Cool. If people want to connect with you, see what you've got going on. You mentioned a TED Talk. You know, where, where would people find relevant things concerning you online? Yeah, sure. So um, the, the first place I would point them would be my website, shaunapandia.com. So that's S-H-A-W-N-A-P-A-N-D-Y-A.com. Um, and that, can, that would be a good springboard. You can find me on most social media platforms at Shauna Pandia. And then if you want to find my TED Talks, I have three of them. I have one on innovation and one on innovation, one on resilience and pushing the limits, and one on discovery and exploration. Just Google TEDx on and that will get to where you want to be. Great. Well, I appreciate you being here. And I have one more request, and that is, how do you want to close up today? What parting words or thoughts, advice, however you want to term it, would you want to leave the listeners with as we roll out? Yeah, I'm going to, um, that's a great question. Um, often I get asked this in, in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, medicine fields, but I think this, this advice applies just as much to martial arts. And um, that is, that is twofold. So first of all, uh, work, work really, really, really hard. Um, you know, that work ethic is, is universally, uh, universally, or a work ethic is universally useful. Um, the second thing is, act like you belong here because you do so don't let anyone tell you you're too young too old too little too big too girly too too mannish to to do what you want to do um and then the last part is set the standard um you know the 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 culture that you you work within whether it's at whether it's at work whether it's within um training um studio whether it's in the dojang that it's a reflection of not just what you preach, but it's a reflection of what you tolerate. So set the standard because people are watching you regardless of your level of training. I think you can really look at Dr. Pena's story in a couple different ways. You can look at it as the story of an immense high achiever, someone who's passionate and dedicated and gives off this vibe of not sleeping, never failing, or you can read between the lines. In fact, you don't even really have to with our conversation today because she was pretty explicit that that's not the case. And really, it's just a constant drive to learn and improve and achieve. And it's something that any of us can do. And I find that empowering. So thank you. I appreciate your candor. I appreciate you coming on. And I look forward to hearing more about your amazing exploits in the future. If you want to check out more about this episode, photos, links, all the stuff that we talked about today, you're going to find it at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, episode 546. 
And shortly after, doesn't usually happen right when the episode launches, but we do get a transcript up for you. If you're up for supporting us, you've got some choices. Podcast 15 for 15% off at whistlekick.com, or leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help with the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you see somebody out there wearing something that they bought from us, something with Whistlekick on it, please say hello, introduce yourself. We're building something. It's growing, and you're part of it. And I appreciate that. If you want to follow along with everything we're doing, check out the social media, at Whistlekick, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, all over the place. My email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And I love hearing from all of you, whether it's guest suggestions or show feedback, topic suggestions, you name it, I want to hear it. Until next time, train hard. Smile and have a great day.